Um, and hopefully there'll be hundreds and thousands of people wanting to speak to uh, Emeritus Professor or Professor Emeritus, Daryl? Well, it's supposed to be Professor Emeritus as far as I can tell. There we are. Okay, yeah. I, I, never, I never know those things. So I just say Prof. All right, let's... It's the bird emergency. It's Monday. That means on the best podcast or live stream about conservation, about birds, about ecology, about protecting our wildlife. Undoubtedly the best and most popular podcast about these issues with me as the host. Hello, Holly. Hi, Grant. How are you? I'm pretty fabulous. It's a pleasure to see you. It feels like it's been forever. Um, how's how's your wet yard? It's soggy, very, very, very soggy. But the sun is shining today, so it's it feels like it's been about three years since I've seen the sun. It's um it's much appreciated, but still very damp. So for those of you who haven't caught up with us before. Dr. Holly Parsons, who is the manager of the Urban Birds Program at BirdLife Australia, lives in New South Wales. And New South Wales has had, um, what, what are we talking, Holly? I think it's the fourth one in 500 year event in 24 months. Yeah, we're getting our averages up. Bloody fantastic. And um, and the prof's back. Um, wow, world, yeah. renowned, world renowned author, Professor... <laughs> Of, um, I was trying to, I was, Daryl, I was reading all the university stuff, Griffith University stuff, and I couldn't decide whether I had to call you uh, a conservation uh, ecologist or an ecologist or just the prof. What's best? Whatever you like. I, I really don't mind at all. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't even use titles at all but um I, I think of myself as an urban ecologist these days you know working in cities and all that stuff so yeah that's pretty much what i am cool and ecologist and the really cool in, sorry an ecologist working in cities and the really really cool thing is that you've done a stack of stuff about urban ecology in brisbane and we're going to talk about one of the case studies today but you're now in kuala lumpur which mm. is a city that I always bang on about with having a really great urban horticulture. Yep, it's a fantastic place to live. I, I wouldn't have thought that before I moved here. I followed my partner who got a job in the university system here and it was my chance to retire from academic crap and um, I loved my job. I, I absolutely loved it, but COVID killed it terribly. So I just then transitioned to house husband slash full-time author. <laughs> And that's pretty is, much what I've been doing ever since. Um, are you still delivering any? That, sorry for you guys who are watching. This is slightly off uh, uh, off the topic, but we will get there in just a, in just a moment. Um, are you still delivering any sort of coursework or contributing to any of the courses? Because the technology allows us to do that nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done a few um, guest lectures, which you can do now, you know, easily. Uh, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm not really teaching anymore. I'm supervising students by the dozen, uh, and finishing up lots of research, which was is still going on. I've got plenty of stuff going on, but I'm just not doing the teaching stuff as much. But you know, the every you know, now that I've been here for nearly two years in Kuala Lumpur, they're starting to discover that I'm here and I'm getting all sorts of opportunities and invitations, which is fantastic. So because I really want to contribute to what what's happening here. That is great. Well, um, check. No doubt you're familiar with the park in the middle of the 
middle of the city. And, oh, yeah. But, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, share share your bird list uh, with me one one day All so right, that so I know right. what to look for next time. So, yeah. um, hello, folks on Facebook. Now, this is what we're going to be talking about. But before we get there, I want to give Daryl the opportunity to have a bit of a plug. You might know Daryl as not only Professor Emeritus from Griffith University, a full-time author, but author of This Time. And This Time is about to about to hit the streets. And this one as well. And they've all got a sort of common theme, haven't they, Daryl? Which is birds yeah, and animals living around us. Absolutely. And maybe we can be a bit more careful about how we treat them and especially the places that they live. So, yeah, that's kind of the story. Yep. It's all about how us, how we interact with wildlife and how important that is and what we can do about it and how we can do it in a better way. Yeah, sure. Now, Holly, before we talk about Daryl's sort of pet project, the, the Compton Road Wildlife Corridor in Brisbane, which Daryl's done a lot of work on and was um, instrumental in getting it going. Tell, uh, tell us what you think the biggest problem, let's start with a problem before we talk about a solution. When it comes to the way we um, go through planning for new suburbs, new developments, from your perspective, what's the biggest problem? Oh, the whole process is, is pretty fraught, okay. to be honest. Um, look, you know, absolutely. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm glad you went there because okay. that's what I see as the, the problem and it isn't talked about a lot. The whole planning process doesn't include wildlife. It's an afterthought rather than a key, um, a, a key plank in the process. And that's frustrating for me. You've been in this field probably, well, probably not as long as I've been watching it because I've got much more grey hair. But we don't seem to have learnt anything. So how does an organisation like BirdLife and someone like you get input into the processes that see new developments uh, get rolled out, you know, week after week, month after month, all over Australia, all the species being impacted, you know. Um, look, we don't a lot of the time. Um, so, you know, each, each state has its own planning processes and so wildlife gets considered sort of down the list, really. It's, it's, it's more around how can you, you know, honestly, how can you maximise um, profits and, you know, the number of, of people or, or space you can convert. Um, so we usually hear about issues during, um, you know, once a DA has been um Made, ava made available for public consultation. Um, and it, it could be something large, it could be something, you know, at a, at a small level that may impact, you know, a species that we work on. Um, and so that's usually the opportunity that, that we have or our supporters have to flag that there are issues. Um, depending on the species, sometimes you might get a little bit of a say earlier on. Um, you know, I know with powerful owls, because we've been working particularly in Sydney for so long, um, sometimes during that sort of initial planning stage, consultants will, will contact us or will be sent to us for, for some input. But, you know, legislatively, there's we have no power in, in dictating, you know, what, what gets decided. All we can do is provide advice on what we know about the particular species um, that's being impacted and hope that it's, it's taken forward. They're not one we're particularly worried about, I have to say. No, Grant. Well, I, I thought we'd rehearse something. Yeah, there we go. There so we you'd go. be worried about these little guys. Yeah. Holly, what's wrong with you? Fair income. <laughs> I, I know. Mean. I've failed today, haven't I? Um, 
Daryl, you, I think the the earliest paper that you um, referred me to that I read was 2011, I think. So we're talking 11 years later. From that perspective of planning and and wildlife being front and centre of land use decisions, have we actually come anywhere positive in that period of time? We have. We have. I, I, I will admit that we have. Um, the problem is it's still so much influenced and based on forceful personalities. If you, write, if you get the right people at the right place and they stick with what you can convince them is good, great things can happen. And that, does, that did happen around Brisbane. But there's just the thing is that's just a complete – so that's the Compton Road fauna overpass just in the southern parts of Brisbane. In 2005, Brisbane City Council decided that they needed to double the size of the road. So there's two bits there. There's, a, you know, there's two lanes going this way and two lanes going the other way. You can't see it because of the shrubbery in the middle. But that, that was doubled in size. And they said and, – and, and it's cutting right through – a conservation area called called Karawatha Forest, which had been declared a, a, a reserve of national significance because of the number of endangered species there. But on that road yeah. there, there were so a- many people. Any of them? Plenty of them. They were getting nailed all the time. Um, and so what? So at the, on, in the same week, Brisbane City Council declared Karawatha as a state of... Uh, a reserve of national significance, and sometime later in that week, the same council said we're going to double the size of the road that goes through the middle, and there was a huge outcry from the local people. There's a fantastic con- um, conservation community group called the uh, Karawatha Protection Society who worked around there, and they went totally ballistic. And the guy in charge of that is was very good at at being informed and organising stuff and doing really fantastic things. He just went straight to the town council people and said, this is not on, we've got to do something. So he forced his way onto a committee, in a sense. And, and, the, town, and the Lord Mayor came out and said, these people have got, got, they've got something to say that's, that's important. Let's listen to them. And so he turned, you know, this was actually in, I'd love to have, have this film somewhere, but he turned to the engineers this is in the sit in the council meeting and said, build the road and expletive, make it work. And they went, We build roads, we're engineers, how the hell do we know anything about that? So that was way back in 2005, and they went, Well, we don't know what's going on. So I I was just one of the people they said, We don't know what the hell to do. Maybe you've got some ideas. And I said, Yeah, sure. And I had no ideas really at all. I'd never even heard of the field of road ecology, but a couple of us, um, Adrian Canaris was the other one, two sort of token ecologists and a bunch of engineers and some people from city council and then some livid community group people all got together and everybody knew that it was the person in charge, the, the person in charge of the of the design. This was very early stages and this is the, the secret before anything had happened. They said, let's all sit down together and see if we can make something work here. And the person from the council said, "This is an. In, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm no. I'm no. I'm the bad person." And what we were all surprised it was a female. She was the female head engineer of the whole project, and she said, "No, this is really important. But it's an engineering problem. We can engineer this and make it work." And that was how it started. And we we just went in blind, but were, and they were willing to listen, and we would come up with ideas out of the blue, out of out of the sky out of the internet somewhere, and we'd say, oh, they're doing this in Holland or we found something going on in Belgium or whatever, you know, all sort of things like this all over the place. And we said, is there any chance we could do these sorts of things here? And to their absolute credit, Brisbane City Council said, I reckon we could, we can try that. What do you think, how big should it be, where should it go? And they were amazing. And that was all to do with the personality of, Mary O'Hare was her name. She now lives in Tasmania. I hope she listens to this at some stage because she needs huge amounts of credit. So oh, long, story, long story short, that got built. 
And we were there, th thankfully, because Griffith University is just up the road from this. And so I had now an amazing research site set up for me. And I started looking at that from before it was finished and, and, till, and it continues to, to, till today. We've been monitoring every, every flaming thing that uses that. And it's not just the a big, a big obvious conspicuous, conspicuous overpass, but there are two special underpasses for wildlife going underneath the road, which you can't see. Extremely importantly is there's very um, sophisticated exclusion fencing, which doesn't let anything bigger than a grasshopper get onto the road. And so everything that wants to cross the road has to use one of the structures. There's rope, three rope ladders going across from canopy to canopy for the possums and gliders. And then there's a line of glider poles which go across the top of the overpass. So it's very comprehensive in terms of the wildlife that can use it. And so it's been incredibly spectacularly successful. And, and so that, that's, I, I use that as a hopeful example, but it's not the model. It's not a template. Well, no, it could be a template for how it should work. Unfortunately, it's very rare. There's, it's the opposite is usually what happens. Yeah, um, I've been involved in lots of projects ever since, and it's engineers make decisions, all right, we'll put the bloody wildlifey thing in, and they put it in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or, or they add it to the, pro, the, the project at the back end, which yeah. makes it 10 times more expensive than if, if yeah. at the design process it had been put in. Now, yeah. how many of these, how many similar structures are in Brisbane? Well, there are, believe it or not, there are now three in Brisbane. Yeah, there's Compton Road, Hamilton Road and Illawena Street. Um, so there's three inside the boundaries of the city of Brisbane. Yep. There are only eight in the rest of Australia. There are only a okay. total of eight in Australia. Now, just well, that, to put it, in, put it into some perspective, there are over 320 in France alone, you know, the yep. big overpasses. So the, the, this is really the point, isn't it, Holly, that – that there are three in Brisbane, there are eight. Is it eight more or eight in total, no, eight Daryl? In total, so there, so there are three in Brisbane. There are five more for the totality of Australia. Whereas, what's required is something to be dug and some structure to be put in under the road and something to be built over the road and they build them on every road anyway. There's something going under every road and there's something going over just about every road, be it a power, be it lines, you know, power lines or whatever. So it, it's possible to build this in really easily to every new project. Hell, I used to install irrigation into new um uh, new developments that is now all built in s suburbs around me. But we got in there, as soon as the curbs were formed, we were in there putting pipes and spri sprinkler heads and and uh, valve boxes and all this stuff that no one was going to use for two years, three years, four years, five years, just so there was some, some amenity for the really for the property developers to have nice street trees and nature strips along the road so that they could sell their stuff. But nobody ever thought about linking the one side of the estate with the other side of the estate so that animals could traverse it. Why are we still, why are we still not there at, I wonder how we, because we're all in the comms space, you know, I'm, I'm the dumbest person in the room in this discussion, but we're all trying to get the message out and thousands of people are trying to get the message out. But why are we still not being able to convey the value of our wildlife to the people who make decisions when the problems are known, they're identified, and the solutions are known and identified. I mean, they're not the only solutions that I just put up. There are heaps of others, but you can you can help frogs and lizards and grasshoppers and kangaroos and 
deer and beaver and wombat get from one side to the other? Why are we still not doing it? Um, look, I think this is similar to a discussion I think we had a couple of weeks ago, Grant, around well, that, well, that, collaborating. That, 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 that's why I got Daryl Daryl on because it yep. follows on to what we were talking about last last week, or week before, week before that, whenever it was. But why at the planning stage? Uh, and and it's easy to blame the councils and the politicians and everyone. Why aren't architects doing it? Why aren't town planners doing it? Why aren't all these people who have the skills and are being consulted? Why aren't they stamping their feet and saying, "No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to submit this because it's rubbish." Why? Where? where that? And this is something I've been having a blue with people on Twitter about in the last little while, because I don't reckon Tanya Plibersek's doing enough about the Greater Glider, and I don't reckon that the Victorian Labor Party and the government here are doing enough. And everyone's going, "Oh, give them time; they're only new." Bullshit. It's easy to stop something when you've got power. It's a lot harder to design the new process, but you can stop the bad thing and then build the good thing. But we yeah. never value the animals. And for a country that relies on part of our tourism appeal to the rest of the world is our unique indigenous wildlife and plant life, why... I'm still flabbergasted why as a community, why all the professions that do the development, well, you know, point at them all. Doesn't anybody take any responsibility for doing the right thing instead of just making a buck? Well, I mean, I mean, that's ultimately it. It's, it's do they know they're doing the wrong thing? That's that, that you know, they're, if they're, and this is not sort of justifying their positions because everybody's coming into the profession that they're in with a different motivation and a different interest. And, you know, for people who maybe go into some of these fields, it's just not something that they're aware about or that, that, that registers as something they should be concerned about. Um, and that's where, you know, like Daryl had that, that engineer who was open and willing to consider something instead of it being another project and, you know, we just tick our boxes and this is what we develop. It it come it requires somebody, unfortunately, who has that willing to look outside the box and, and I think look the at the floodwaters things. have got into Holly's. Uh, uh... You think so? Oh no, no! It, it, I don't know if it's you freezing or it's me. I think it, Daryl was it Holly for you? Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't no, see any freezing. No, okay, oh, it must be my. No, I think uh, it's Holly, my <laughs> Uh, Daryl, can I inject something again controversial into the discussion to get your further comment? That'd be a big surprise. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, at the risk of, uh, I'm not discounting what you what you said there, Holly. Except I am. These people have got kids, right? Those kids are lying on the floor of their lounge room, drawing possums and kangaroos and koalas. And and they're having discussions about the barrier reef and blah blah blah. So it's bullshit for anyone to say we don't know. These people, unless they are not involved in the community, they know. They but they can compartmentalise it away from their job, right? This is my view, uh, Daryl. I really want your input on this. Because I've, I've spread out all those plans over big tables and can we shift this tap from here to there? Oh, that's going to cost $700 if we do that. If we have to do it for 14 of them, oh, 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 right? I've had all those discussions with landscape architects and project managers and property developers. And that's the detail they get to at the back end of the project oh, we can't fix something that we stuffed up. So all these professionals know the Barrier Reef is stuffed. They know we're deforesting the, the country. You know, they uh, do they not know that we're about to lose the koala? You know? so But, oh, it's not my job. Not my job. Am I being too harsh, Daryl? 
No, not at all. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, so so let me just say a couple of things. Um, there seems to be like there's a there's a precedence thing. It's like it's like it in law. So when when the when it when the, the media and, and the right wing people got got word that we were going to build a big bridge over you know cost a lot of money and build a bridge over over a road, there was the usual backlash kind of stuff. Highway for cane toads, you know, it was all the <laughs> usual stuff, right? Well, within when we were monitoring, we were we were in there within six months of it opening. We've got to let it settle down a bit, let the animals get used to this massive change in their life. Um, we within six months of it becoming available for the animals to use, we had forty five individual animals every single night crossing the thing. And so from right from the beginning, it was so unbelievably successful. It was beyond comprehension how successful it was. And what that led to was it, a thing called, so I've been, I've been, I have had lots of meetings with road engineers over the years. And it used to be that someone would say, well, in, in Europe, they're building stuff. And they, the road engineers would say, yeah, but it's not going to work for kangaroos or it's, that's okay in Belgium or wherever. It's not going to work here. We don't have any evidence or Canada. It's, you know, no, these things don't, they might work for deer in Canada, but, you know, there's not going to be, koalas aren't going to use the same thing or there's no evidence for them. Come along this thing, Compton Road, and then I would see, they didn't know, you know, I'd, I'd often have meetings with, with, um, with councils or with engineers or with consultants, and some engineer would come up to me and say, bloody Compton Road. Ah, oh, everybody knows about it in Brisbane now. It's and so there, there is genuinely a Compton Road effect. It was, you mean it works, and we can't use the excuse that there's no evidence anymore because we were just pumping out, and that was our goal to put out every possible thing: birds, mammals, reptiles, lizards, gliders. Every bloody thing was using them, and so there, it was no longer possible to say they it didn't work. Now that changed things dramatically at the southeast Queensland level. So we're just talking about one little bit of Australia. But because it got so well known there, the standard rose. And so it became in in the the people who provide the, the Department of, in, of Environment in Queensland have to sign off on a big project like, like this or any road project or any railway project. And there's there's always a stipulation in there about impact on biodiversity. And because the Compton Road thing had become so well known, they it's not legislated anywhere, but the, the um, conditions for approval included what are you going to do about the biodiversity? And that, that became just written into the approvals. Not legislation yet at all, but, but at the local level or at least the state level that was in there. And that led to all sorts of changes. Unfortunately for the majority of them, it was just a tick-the-box approach, a you know, minimalist, well, we've got to do something, we'll just stick in a pipe somewhere and let them, you know, that can be our wildlife bridge. And so there was some wildlife crossing structure and there was a lot of terrible ones. And I, and they would often come to us after the whole thing is completely built and say, we're, we're required by our approvals to have somebody monitoring it. Can you come and do it? And I went, what? No, I'm not going to do that. You just That's ridiculous. It's in the wrong place anyway. So, But what, what happened there was there was this strange um, raising of expectations of what can be done, at least in South East Queensland. And that's spread out a little bit around Australia now. But, it, but what would, will be happening is the people in Melbourne will be saying, well, it might work in Queensland, but it's no evidence yeah. that it's here. You know, the usual story. But I'm very pleased to say that the last big project I was dealing with, the, the third overpass in Illawina Street, was a big international company who knew that this would, would, was on the table. They knew how the level of opposition they were going to get from the locals because it was in the same area. It was actually at the other end of Karawatha, this new one, where they were up, upgrading a huge motorway, a tollway. And they knew there was going to be there was strife, so they got in straight away, and, and they invited me and all the other local com conservation groups and community groups to come on board right from the beginning. So that's exactly what's supposed to happen. It's very rare that it does happen, but it worked a treat. And they said, "We want to be known." The company, this big nasty tollway company, wanted to be known as somebody friendly to biodiversity. They wanted that to be something that because they see. You know, they see there's value in it for their brand. And that's that's really hopeful. 
but it but it's still incredibly rare. But it once it can be done, there's there's hope that others can take it on. But you know, so that that's a good sign, a good thing, you know, uh, something that's worth knowing about. But it's still not anywhere near as common as it should be. Holly, do you know of any similar examples in your patch? Um, there's not a lot. So um, I think there's Western Sydney somewhere. There's in the last 12 months, I think there's been some sort of wildlife ladder type installations done. Um, but I'm not, I mean, it's only early days of monitoring those. So I'm not sure of how no, successful they are. But yeah, it's not It's not a common occurrence, as, as Daryl said. I can't think of one that isn't a pipe like you referred to, Daryl, you know, hell, we've got, we'll just stick in four extra, you know, large drainage pipes and call that a wildlife corridor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but but so let, me say, let me say something here because that's really important. So under underneath every road in the universe, there are there are culverts just for water management. Yeah. You know, they're, they're everywhere. And so we, a big project, Quite different to the other ones, but still trying to get animals safely across roads. It's all about it's all about koalas. You, you know, one, nobody cares about anything except cute koalas. But we were we were we uh, we were asked by Main Roads Department of, Queens, of Queensland to look at a whole lot of places in the vicinity of, of Brisbane to see whether there was something we they could do possibly about the carnage of the koalas. I've been hammered on the roads. Terrible. And so we went to all, all these hot spots where lots of koalas were killed. And the only and there was no way you can build a really expensive overpass after the road's there. You mm. can't do it. You've got to do it when the road's being upgraded or built in the first place. It's just too big an engineering problem. But you can do stuff under the road. And so we went, well, there's not much else we can do building-wise, but they've got all these existing culverts here. Can we do something with the culverts? And so we eventually came up with an idea of a, a kind of retrofitting to a big culvert, because they're often full of water. In Queensland, it rains all the time. It's been raining continuously in Queensland and New South Wales for years, it seems now. So they're all full of water. And so the water, most animals will not get their feet wet. But if you put what we worked out was it's cheap and easy to do this. You put in a, a platform under the road on the bolted to the side of the, of the culvert's wall. And as long as there's a, a fence above so they can't walk over the road, they're forced to go looking for another place and they go under the road along just a, a platform, a little, a little platform thing, a ledge that's, that's been bolted in. Easy to use, easy to do, cheap, you know, and it's, it looks like a great solution. And so they're everywhere now in Queensland, everywhere. There's hundreds of them, or probably not hundreds. I'd say probably 60 to 70 of them now, and nobody even knows about them. And every night, some koalas, but echidnas and and yes, cats and foxes and wallabies and brush turkeys and everything go, uses them. And they're, they're really successful. And there's a, there's a little easy, cheap solution that people need to know about because everywhere with a koala, they should be putting these things in. So this doesn't have to be grandiose and outrageously expensive. You can do other things. I'm looking for the... Uh, there was a picture that I saw but I can't find it now, sorry, with the ledge um, oh, yeah. bolted inside um, yeah. uh, the culvert, but I didn't have the rights to, it no. wasn't a shareable one that I could. Um, I can send you, send you some of the pictures well, afterwards. That would be great. And we'll put them yeah. on the web, uh, on the web page that accompanies this when we get around to publishing it in a little while. Um, so how, how do we shift the needle that you have to get public pressure to make councils make the conditions for development wildlife friendly and we need to get the engineers be they building bridges roads um town planners um, all the people who are designing housing estates, oh, yeah. all the people who are giving us the worst triangle of land in a in a development as a offset to protect biodiversity. Um, uh, what what do you, what do you both think is 
the first necessary action to get to all of these different classes of people? Holly. Oh, God. Why did you ask me first? Um, I don't think there is one first step. I think this is a, such a massive, challenging overhaul that is needed that um, there, there needs to be, you know, for local issues, local groups, you know, really have, you know, c can influence, you know, local councils are going to be concerned about their constituents and noise from their constituents. So anytime local groups are can get active um, and can raise awareness, then you've got that sort of local concern, which they, which can, can do things. Um, but in terms of how you get to change planners and, and landscape architects and, you know, it's, it's kind of multifaceted, you know, there needs to be education built into the courses that they do while they're training, but there needs to be legislative change as well. Like they need to, there needs to be some accountability and some legal requirement, um, for um, changes to be made to how biodiversity is viewed and and how you know whatever it is is being designed, whether it's it's you know a, a road development or whether it's a new um, housing estate going in. Um, right, Daryl, can you see this? That's me with my tongue firmly in my cheek. Okay, okay. Um, Daryl, you've made a career sitting in your ivory tower, uh, being a boffin academic what are you people in academia doing to train these other people well we're, we're trying our best i actually <laughs> i actually was um invited to do an urban ecology course at griffith which is still going on even though i'm not there anymore so it was literally this was like a dream come true for an academic like what's your biggest passion in in life here run a course on it i couldn't believe my eyes and that's totally about that. It was it was about what can we do? There's tons we can do. Everybody needs to know about it. And every second week from the labs, would I would invite an engineer or a, a green architect or somebody to come and talk about green roofs or, or you know, uh, how to build a road properly or how to make what's the latest design in whatever it is. You know, all sorts of things was going on there. So what I will say is, and you you were right. So I want to say to Holly. Absolutely. The, the biggest thing, the most influence you can have is through well-informed, really enthusiastic community groups. They work at the local level. That's where it all really happens. It's all local. Every, all this is local. If you can get one of these things in your patch, over your road, in your place where you walk every day and you really value that place, that's where it'll happen because those people will start hammering on the door of the local member and making their voice heard and saying, we're not going to vote for you bastards if you don't do something properly. And that's, that's where the, the, the stuff works. And so and just a little, a little aside, I was um, a supervisor for a project which was looking, trying to figure out why certain things got onto the um, legislative agenda or the policy agenda at state level governments. And the thing that came out absolutely the clearest was dedicated, persistent, but polite local community groups. They got so much done, people listened to them if they did the right thing. And they were willing to compromise on occasions, you know, and weren't just don't do whatever, you know, like they were, you had to have to allow the other people to talk. And, and so when genuine cooperation and collaboration occurs, that's when things can go on. And so that's, that's what, so, and you, and the other thing, Grant, you mentioned, we're involved in comms. I'm, for, for probably the last 20 years, I've just dedicated my life to turning whatever science I know or read about or do myself into stuff that ordinary people can understand. Of. That's, that's my utter passion. That book is entirely for that reason. It's to try and say there's tons of stuff being done all around the world and you need to know about it. People need to know that. Good. Perfect. <laughs> Who People wants need to, to know and hear about these things because then they can say, oh, I didn't even know that you can put a ledge under a road. I'm going to get on to my local council about that. Did they know about that? Why, did, why didn't we hear about that? Why aren't they talking about that? You know, like get that stuff rolling. That can be a big difference. Yeah, of, of course, I'm being a little bit um, uh, provocative there by saying be a shit stirrer. But I think um, 
people sometimes say, how come I'm not nice to everyone on when I'm engaging with them in certain platforms? We've been nice. All my bloody life, we've been nice. Yeah. And where are we? You know, yeah. where, where are we? And here we are. No recovery plan for the Australian marsupial in place, despite it being identified as a requirement nine years ago. Australian governments failed to halt decline. Talking about the koala, you know, um, apart from the kangaroo, what's Australia known for when it comes to animals? And it's the koala. And in nine years, nothing got done because everybody is being nice to the rotten bastards who do nothing. Um, so there's my uh, there's my standpoint. Um, hello everyone on all the platforms that are watching. Uh, got something to say to us or to, uh, probably only want to say it to Daryl or to Holly. So um, ask a question, pop it in there and we'll, um, uh, we'll discuss it. Um, Daryl, the... <sighs> Are we only, uh, 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 let me put it a different way. Are we in danger of only focusing on icon species, like you said, and I've been flashing up the koala all the time, but does that mean that we are in danger as a, as a group, as a, um, you know, you're, you're the people with, with the knowledge of being pushed and pressured into solutions that leave other species out like is because often again here's i'm a con, i'm a conspiracy theorist all right so i've just got my tinfoil hat on at the moment but sometimes divide and conquer is a good way to get the cheapest option done rather than the best offer option done so you can build something that's good for koalas but isn't good for frogs, right? Um, or, I don't know, probably insects. Who cares about insects, right? Um, but it's good for kangaroos and it's good for, good for koalas. So, right, we've done, our, we've done our job. Is there a danger that there, there isn't enough know-how and knowledge put into the design and then the implementation of some of these projects. Did you follow where, where I was going? Yeah, there's a bit of stuff in there. <laughs> but I think I've got the thread. Um, yes, that, that's definitely a possibility. But so far, we all know we just work with this. Hollywood is so aware of this. You know, if it's if it's a if it's a iconic species, you just go with that species and you hope desperately that it'll bring along all the other stuff. So the Compton Road was built for koalas, even though there's not that many koalas in the area. There's many more other things which were more important, if, in a sense. But we got that done and we designed it for everything. It's a vegetated overpass. Now, I'm a bird dude, you know, and I didn't even think about birds using it. Birds can fly, can't they? Well, it didn't take me that long to realise that the little birds were not going to cross four lanes of space. They're never going to do it. But they were... As soon as the vegetation was thickened across the top of the overpass, they were going over like steam. There was 70 birds a day going over there at certain stuff, you know, during migration times. It was amazing. Um, so we, we can do it. So there's a little bit of underhand stuff. Yeah, we'll build your koala bridge, but we're going to, you know, we're not going to tell you, but we're going to make it friendly for everything else as well. But let me just go. So you talk, talked about, you know, the possibility of getting sidelined into iconic stuff. I'm going to suggest something pretty radical. I'm going to say I think we're being convinced that it's got to be a grandiose construction. There's many other things we can do as well. And that's where I want to talk. I'm, my question to Holly is let's just forget about these million-dollar overpass things and stuff, which are great, fine, of course they're good. But there's got to be low-level local solutions for birds and butterflies and all that other stuff. And they're probably even more important at the local level. Mm. And so, yeah, let's just talk about that because I think that's really crucial because it's a lot of people will say, yeah, an overpass here would be wonderful, but there's no way the council's going to fund it. But is there something we can do planting gardens or whatever? Yeah, so yeah I, I absolutely agree, Daryl. I think you're right that the, the, the 
the aspiration of something like a, a massive overpass is is probably going to be out of reach for a, a lot of you know what we're dealing with now where we've got these roads in place where we've got you know a bushland patch and a whole heap of houses you know that's you know something big and grandiose is going to cost a fortune and nobody's going to give it the time of day because there's no budget to be able to do that work so it is about looking for those little wins and and what can you do at that local level that is going to be low cost and is going to you know be effective and and use an icon species i love using an icon species i use it all the time you know there's there there an umbrella that you can fit you know a whole suite of of similar species um to bring along, you know, with whatever um, habitat restoration you're doing. Um, so I think, you know, th there's certainly ways and and the need to engage individuals in a lot of this action and and getting them involved through hooking them in an iconic species, but um, also giving them practical, easy to do um, steps means that you've got a higher likelihood of actually getting a result rather than waiting for a budget cycle that has a huge amount of money and the right development to to actually take ahead some big project it's i'm taking off my tinfoil hat now and now i'm putting on my captain obvious cap the things that connect these areas of existing and important habitat are generally one of two things, roads or waterways, actually three, and perhaps railway lines. But we are not revegetating or preserving vegetation along those corridors generally, rivers and creeks probably a little bit um, excluded. There's been some really good waterway management. But local communities who are very loud are often talking about the danger of vegetation, the risk of vegetation, and and often with you know good good cause. Is vegetation for wildlife in these important connective, possibly connective tissue for one of a much better term, between important areas of habitat, um, is it possible to, to satisfy both the requirements? The requirements for wildlife, the ecological needs, and to keep, keep communities safe from fires, the obvious one. Floods, another one now. It, it really it depends entirely on where you are and what the local situation is. It'll, it'll be it'll be very much site by site what what will be important. I mean, everyone. Well, it wasn't that long ago that we we're all utterly, completely obsessed with fire. Now we're obsessed about drowning. So you know, it's it's a very different world. Um, but yeah, no, you 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 you're, you're right about those sorts of things. Um, the thing that breaks my heart is how many people say. Those big trees must go. They are a threat, and you know, they might fall on a house or something. And that's, you know, those trees are five hundred years old sometimes, and in, you know, beyond value in terms of habitat for animals. And, and yet they're getting pulled down all the time. That's, that's but, really dreadful. But we are funding a few nest boxes, and that's and we think that's the solution. You know, that's it. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll cut down five hundred hectares of trees, and we'll put up fifty nest boxes. Be fixed, no problem. Yeah, no, we've got to get away from that. But, but you know, we, we're a long way from being sensible about this in terms of ecological. I was thinking more of, again, you know, I'm always trying to be optimistic as, if I possibly can, you know, and, and wondering if Holly's got any, any examples from the Sydney area. There was a thing called a pollinator link, it's called, in Brisbane. And it was some somebody looked and looked at the maps and said there's a big patch over here and a big patch over here and a whole matrix of horrible houses and roads in between. Can we do something about it? And somebody who was an insect, a, a butterfly freak, came up and said, what we could do is see if, well, there's lots of little council patches all the way along, and they sort of mapped out a kind of connective corridor, if you like, that included 
lots of people's houses and they actually went door knocking and explaining to people and had lots of workshops and stuff. And eventually what they did was they were able to convince sometimes every, you know, third house or whatever to, to add to or change in some way their backyard vegetation. Hmm. And so there now is a very effective corridor for, it was originally intended for butterflies, but now we know that the um, little birds, you know, the, the especially the insectivorous birds and the um, and some of the nectivorous birds are now using it as well because it's flowers. You know, they they put in flowers for but, for butterflies and lots of other things like flowers as well. And people love flowers as well. So this thing is now working really well. They, they, it's allowing a kind of um, stepping stone sort of approach across. There's even a place where it crosses a big, a big busy road, and that what they've done is they've vegetated amazingly a big uh, roundabout in the middle of it. You know, and if if the butterflies are careful, they can get across to the other spot and then across to the next patch. And so, you know, there there are even things like that which can prove to be really well. I mean, there's there's a lot of scepticism whether they will be big in the in the in the long term, but what I see is that those they are coming out of uh, very passionate, concerned locals, and they're going to take that passion and interest and concern big picture as well, not just their own patch. And it, that's part of what this is, is. It's about getting people thinking broadly and at a landscape level and even you know, internationally about the importance of habitat. Because if, you, if you're thinking, gee, my backyard is now a habitat for visiting animals, I wonder whether that's important for my big, you know, for the park where I go walking the dog, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Part of the the thing I always want to push, and I mean Holly and I did a, a, a show about this a, a little while ago about the kinds of plants you can choose for certain uh, things. But what I would like us to move towards is not only all the planning decisions being made, but when the councils are doing something like that stepping stone approach with an idea about butterflies. Well, councils used to have their own nurseries, right? I think they've nearly all been flogged off or closed down. But then they could come and give everybody two or three plants after somebody's had a look at their backyard and go, this would be perfect for your place. Yep. And so would this. Yep. So uh, all uh, historically, we've given a whole lot of responsibility to a whole lot of bodies to do stuff, to make decisions, to to come up with guidelines. But then we went through, you know, the Kennett years and the, um, thanks, Jeff, piece of shit, um, <laughs> that just downgraded all this public assets and all the corporate knowledge that was in all these places and set us back 50 years. And... For public amenity is is going to be my my point, but you look at Britain, where they've got this rewilding thing going on, where they're celebrating the meadows of wildflowers along roadsides and inter connecting suburbs and and counties and whatnot, because they've got this focus on pollinators. When's the last time you heard someone in public life issue the word pollinator when it wasn't about a bee and agriculture? Sure. Yeah, this look, is... I'll, I'll just jump in really quickly. There are a whole, and maybe it's around sort of promoting them properly or more, um, there are a whole range of local initiatives um, on the ground, you know, in Melbourne, in Sydney, in Brisbane, throughout. Um, I think it's, it's down to sort of, you know, people to sort of do a bit of digging and see what's going on locally in your area. Um you're right, like, you know, local nurseries can be really hard to come across. When they do, they are gold um, for getting plants. You know, you've got plants that are locally native. You've got plants that are usually a lot cheaper than you would buy at a commercial nursery, um, you know, that are going to grow really well in your conditions too. And so it's, you know, there is a need to try and discover where those pieces of, um, you know, those those nurseries are. And um, at least around Sydney, there's, there's still a really good number. Um, lots of councils do have those initiatives too. So, you know, Gardens for Wildlife in Victoria are doing amazing things and partnering with local councils. In Sydney, there's things like the Habitat Network um, in around the city of Ride as well. 
Uh, there's a B and B um, highway project um, which is linked with UTS in Sydney mm. as well. That's sort of looking at that sort of pollinator relationship. So those projects are around. Um, probably more so than they used to be because we've seen this rise of things like citizen science becoming um, um, much more sort of mainstreamed um, and common. Um, so I, I think though there are they are around. It's a, it's a matter of sort of tapping into your local one and, and seeing where you fit in. But even if there isn't, there is still, you know, I'd like to think Birds in Backyards fills a gap for people to, to even if they don't have a local on-ground project um, identifying a corridor, they they still know and learn the things that they can do to put in the ground to to help um, birds as a umbrella for you know pretty much everything. Um, sorry, um, so that those those tools are around. It's, it's about sort of doing the digging and finding them. And of course, you know, if you're in a capital capital city, there's you know that's that's where there is you know generally some more funding and some more of those projects um, existing. Um, but I think most places should be able to connect to some sort of um, at least a plant list or, um, you know, a, a project that may at least inspire them to, to do some work locally as well. And, of course, I'm totally unreasonable. I want it all. I want it all now. Mm -hmm. and, and I want a perfect world. But, again, when we're developing main roads, we've got the... Department of Main Roads, are they called, still called DMR in New South Wales? And we've got uh, yeah, yeah. we've got Vic Roads in uh, in uh, in Victoria. Um, it's TMR um, in Queensland. It's Transport and Main Roads in Queensland. Yeah, and it, and every state has got one. And then um, I, I I would like to see that as well as specifying the the size and the type of road base and the size and the type of um, bitumen, the paving material and cat size that need to be, that can or can't be on every road. I'd like to see all of these thing, things have um, uh, a, a, a percentage or, or some way to measure the connectiveness of those those roads um, to the to the to the destination it, uh, you follow what I'm saying well we've got freeways everywhere we've got highways everywhere we've got main arterial roads everywhere and they're the natural places that would connect uh, areas easily because they don't have a lot of human traffic dogs, um, you know, all that kind of stuff that deters wildlife from going in other areas that we think we're putting aside for them, but we're not utilising them. We're not utilising two metres or six metres or however much space could be given to wildlife, to biodiversity, to make those transport thoroughfares also wildlife thoroughfares. Am I, am I not seeing something or am I seeing something being too easy? Mate, you're very European. This is, they've been doing that for years in, in, in Europe. I mean, I, I should tell you that in, if you belong to the EU and, you, and you're a, putting in a new road or a new railway somewhere, you have to, right from the beginning, you have to show how are you going to provide a way for biodiversity to cross your road or railway or whatever it is, every, on average, every 500 metres of your of your linear infrastructure. And that's just written in, you know, how will you do it? Show us how you will do it. And and they, because they are staring the apocalypse in the face, they've they've had, you know, centuries of wars and and habitat destruction, and they know exactly what's going to happen. They, they are holding on to the merest threads of what, what that what's left. And they understand absolutely how invaluable those places are. Let's not get in Australia, get get to that stage. They're, they're, you know, it's almost lost in Europe because there's hardly anything left. We've got a whole continent still with, thankfully, lots of animals, lots of them in, in trouble. But let's get, you know, let's value them before we get to that stage. But the, the, the further point, Daryl, which makes it infuriating for me, is if you go to Holland 
or France and you see their wild animals, well, the wild animals in Holland are the same kind of wild animals in France and Belgium, right? Absolutely. But where where else can we get if we if we drive the koalas to with, to extinction, we can't get any from Belgium or from Holland. I guess unless they're in a zoo, but <laughs> we should be the people most concerned about these issues of anywhere in the world. You would think so, wouldn't you? It's. I think uh, it's also a bit of Grant probably. I don't know, might, might be speaking for other people too much. It might be a bit of that sort of taken for granted and the whole the whole issue that, you know, Daryl and I have probably come against, up against many times in urban ecology is that urban is spaces are seen as less than. They are, you know, the junk space that you only get ibis and magpies and a dog that's decided to pop his head in. Um, <laughs> that So you're not seeing, so people assume that koalas are out there in the bush and so we don't need to consider them on roads because most of them are not on roads. That's probably not true. Um, that the, the proportion in, in urban spaces is actually really high, but it's around that public knowledge um, of, of what the actual situation is and the value that urban spaces do have for a huge range of wildlife. I just don't think is, is well understood. People are familiar with their rainbow lorikeets and their cockatoos and, and things and, and not really seeing the whole breadth of, of um, wildlife that can be supported. If anybody's ever hit a wombat or a kangaroo or a wallaby or an emu at 100 kilometres an hour, you will never forget your experience with wildlife on a road, I can guarantee you, and you will probably need a new car. So, <laughs> Daryl, you've mentioned that Europe is um, miles ahead of us and that it's an intrinsic part of the planning process. Where else in the world that you're aware of are they doing it well and are there examples that we could follow, that we could absorb the experience from, of? It's so different. The, the animals we've got here are so different. Um, than, so in, there's some general, general principles you can use from Europe. I mean, Europe is honestly centuries ahead of us some parts of canada are good um some individual states as usual in the united states are, are good but this this whole road ecology thing is starting to spread internationally even malaysia has got overpasses and underpasses for wildlife now but they're all over the place you know sri lanka has just opened a new one despite all the problems there they're everywhere and they're kind of importing the ideas and the you know the the engineering solutions and all those sorts of things from from elsewhere and using them locally. So you've got to take, I think engineers have done this all the time, is, is take a, a general principle and apply it and adapt it to your local conditions and that's, that's what we've always done. So, yeah, so it's happening all around the world but nothing compares to Europe. And I, as I was trying to, to get across the idea of, because they're so desperate, it's a little bit like conservation in New Zealand. They are staring actual extinction in the face on a daily basis. You, that, that, that focuses the mind. We, we, we are actually as well, but we don't seem to. We, it's so big, plenty of animals out there. And Polly's point was really well made. This is, you're absolutely right. Nature is somewhere out of town. You go driving in your four-wheel drive to see nature. No, nature exists. We're so lucky in Australia to see the, the variety, the diversity of animals in your backyard, in your local town is un unlike virtually anywhere in the world. You know, go to New York and see well, how many wildlife things are in, you know, downtown New York compared to downtown Melbourne or Brisbane. Maybe not downtown, but the suburbs of Brisbane, you know, or, or Melbourne or wherever. We've got so many animals here, native animals thriving and looking so well. Um, it's outside. So, you know, they're all around us. Nature is not absent from the city, and that's... That's, um, it's really important for people to realise that. I've recounted this story before countless times in different formats, but uh, Daryl, you won't have heard it. Um, I shared a house 
must be in the 90s, um, would have been late 90s. And we had a spare room and and so, as we all do, we rented out um, to somebody. And this English guy who was um, studying similar to what, what I did at, at Horticulture Parks and Gardens Management, he was to, he just graduated in something similar in in England, and was coming over here to work um, to do a placement six months or nine months or something. So I took him down to where my uh, family place was in Gippsland, and jumped in the car and headed down there on a uh, an early afternoon, and as we get past Terrelgan and we get into the uh, the wilds. He would just emus running alongside the car, kangaroos, wombats. I pointed out koalas. We get to the house where I have um, had a, a deck and overlooking a, a, the lake system down there and whatnot. And I threw out a couple of handfuls of uh, of seed out onto the the back deck. A massive, massive flock, you know, 50, 60 rainbow lorikeets, galahs, crimson and uh, eastern rosellas, uh, wedgies. Uh, no, not wedgies, what am I saying? Wedgies. I'm saying um, uh, 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 galahs, sulphur-crested cockatoos, um, brush bronze wings, all come in. And he's just... <laughs> could, he fed and could not believe it. And once we got back to um, uh, back to Melbourne, for weeks he would just be saying, "Oh, that was amazing." And I'd hear him talking to his mum and his auntie and his friends from college, and all he's talking about was this assault on his senses of the mm. colours, the shapes, the movement, the noise from all just those <laughs> just. Could not believe it. Yeah, yeah. And look, I'm bang on about it all the time. We are so close to losing it because mm. we're being complacent. Yeah. And we are not doing anything really about it. And Holly, when's the last time you heard somebody who was sitting in a decision maker's seat who said anything about pollinators? Yeah, it's been a while. Or, or, or seed eating birds. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really challenging field to work in um, and to try and get a seat at those sort of tables. Um, it's absolutely something that needs to happen. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a long, slow process, unfortunately. Um, um, and we need to try and work out how to speed that process up. Definitely. Now, um, let, let's, let's dial the, dial the knob up to positive uh, again. Um, and again, an invitation to those of you in uh, watching and again, oh, on all the platforms still, feel free to pose a question, put in a comment, tell us something that's going on in your area or um, a good example that you know of so we can publicise it. Daryl, how, how can... How can Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. or Master or Mary or Michael, average, um, make a difference? Yeah, I was, it's, now that you've gone positive for a moment, I think that's really important to realise. So although you don't necessarily see this going on, but I, was, I, was, I probably was getting 60 public talks a year for the last couple of years, just trying to get these ideas out. And there is a huge number of people involved in a huge number of activities, quietly working away in there. And in Brisbane, they're called catchment groups. So everybody's local, like, um, you know, water, water management zone has been divided up. And there's probably, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them in all, of, all over Brisbane. Some of those places are just so full of enthusiastic, every weekend they're out planting or weeding or doing something in their local patch and really valuing their patch and turning what used to be just a weed-covered piece of crap into now very valuable um, habitat for wildlife, and the wildlife is, is appreciating it and, and taking off. So there's all that stuff is going on all the time. 
And, and I see those people as quietly political. You don't see them out with placards, but you see them, they often invite the local member or the local ward guy or the, you know, federal member or something in for a morning tea to tell him about their new, they planted a whole lot of koala plants or, you know, whatever, just to show it off. And I see them doing really effective work just in a quiet, diligent way in the, in the background rather than being really heavy duty and, and, and um, vocal as, as we might see. So because they're not so conspicuous, we don't notice what's going on. But it's a little bit, I think it's, there's reminiscent, reminiscent, it is reminiscent of the Teals in the last federal election. Those people were, they just generated the, the concerned ordinary folk who live in, the, in those electorates and changed Australian politics, you know, in one, one hit. And that sort of thing is kind of going on at the local level. And I think there's a lot more optimism now that we've got, well, at least we've ditched the bastards and we've got a different set of maybe not quite as bad bastards, but they, they at least appear at the, at the beginning to be a little bit more open to some of this stuff. They don't want to go in too fast, I don't think. But so I, I'm I'm pathetically optimistic about some things. Not at the global level. I think we're screwed. But don't tell anybody that. Um, but but at, at the local level, I'm I'm all you know. I'm I'm now involved in my local park. It's a very big conservation park, and it's always under threat from developers. Um, you know, corruption is a huge issue here in Malaysia, and and it's always going to you know. Which politician is going to sell it off to his mate to build another set of flats that nobody needs? So I'm in, deeply involved in that sort of local politics now, um, as well. I'm the I'm the sort of token ecologist for them. But so I think everyone's got to work locally, and that's where that's where the action happens. It's no different here, though. Yeah. Um, the the corruption just looks different. Oh yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Ev every council is f about fifty percent uh, representatives. Who are backed by developers? Yeah. So yeah. it's just a different kind of corruption. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, generally, those people don't get to buy a yacht a, or, or a motor vessel or something. They will probably get a discounted um, loan to purchase properties. Uh, I mean, it's it's insidious everywhere because when uh, and and this is why I want to keep bringing this up how again a good question for whoever's phone is vibrating there um, <laughs> um how do we how do you think daryl i mean you're you're now in in malaysia where there's a totally different culture and at looking at animals um the the value and the worth of them um Maybe it's not so different, but I'm I'm thinking it's a bit different. How how do we how do we increase the value that the community holds the everyday animals and plants, insects around us compared to the value of Italian white Italian tiles on a new kitchen, a renovated kitchen. Uh, <laughs> It's a big contrast. Um, well, it, but again, no, again, I'm going to come back to the vibrant, enthusiastic members of a local community group of some sort. Those people have so much. They talk to their neighbours. They talk to their kids when they're picking up their kids. They walk their dog with their neighbour, you know, all that kind of local stuff. Oh, have you seen, did, like, like just instant, for instance, my neighbours told me because he didn't know who I was. Did you realise that there were woodpeckers in our, in our patch just here? And I went, oh, woodpeckers. You know, like that's when I realised... I really have moved, you know. I've, I've got woodpeckers here, and and you know, and squirrels, not possums. Uh, but it's the same thing, you know. It's the enthusiastic. Um, did you see that? Isn't that wonderful? Oh, I didn't know they were even here. Are they native? Yes, they're native. You know, like all that sort of conversations. Those ones at local, at the local level, I've said it a thousand times already. That's where it all. That's where it matters because those people will get enthusiastic, talk, tell their kids. The kids will talk to their other kids at home. And then when the when the local member comes down to open the council or the you know the kindergarten or whatever, they will hear about these people and and hear their views. So I I I put my optimism into those people in those communities, and that's where everybody should be working as much as I can. I think. Holly, you're working at BirdLife, BirdLife Australia, mm -hmm. extremely important for a whole 
number of uh, reasons. But you're about, uh, I'm sorry to spring this on you too, because we haven't talked about this, but oh, excellent. You, but you're, but you're rolling out a program which is a, doing exactly what we're talking about, mm -hmm. getting to people who can influence people. And yep. that's kids yep. influencing their parents, gang gangs in school, go. Yeah, so uh, we, we've just, gang gang cockatoos have been a bit of an icon species that we've been working with um, recently, um, but it forms part of a larger Birds in Schools project that we've had running for a few years now, and that's all about engaging kids with their local bird life. Um, and instead of being a one-off visit to the school to teach them about birds, this is about the whole classroom um, learning about their local bird life, whether it's gang gangs or whether it's sulfur crested cockatoos or rainbow lorikeets, um, and being observant, noticing what's going on in their school grounds, teaching kids how to monitor their birds. They've got to do a little bit of math. They've got to learn to interpret their data. Um, but, you know, they're, they're taking what they know about their local bird life and, impl and implementing action plans. So, okay, what are they going to do? These are the birds they've got on their grounds. It might be ones that are causing some problems. It could be ones that are around, but maybe they want more of them. And they've got to create and implement a plan to, to help their local bird life. So it's been really amazing to see how that has evolved depending on the teachers that are running that, that project. Um, you know, we, we try and keep it nice and flexible. So, you know, teachers can be guided by student interests or their own interests. We've seen, you know, of course we see nest boxes, we see plants go in the ground, um, we see waste management changes. If there's ibis and things causing problems, they look and investigate different bins and things. Um, but, you know, we've seen art competitions. We've seen, you know, local advocacy, you know, kids asking questions about rat poisons. You know, we've we've seen, you know, assemblies and interpretive dance and, you know, kids getting engaged using birds as the way to, to I guess, learn about their local environment and, and get them involved in that action. Okay, they know they've got these birds. What are they going to do about it? And I think that's the really critical element of this project. It's it's enabling the kids to actually be the drivers of change and it's it's really exciting. Um, so that's, you know, available and open for um, any teacher who, uh, primary school, who is keen to get involved. Um, we, we run it all the way through the year. It's all done via um, basically us enabling and supporting the teacher through some e-learning um, and um, a wonderful project officer, Alex, to deliver it. So whether you've got gang gangs or you're just interested in birds wherever you are across Australia and you're a teacher, there's um, that resource is available. Yeah, sorry, Perth, no gang gangs over there. No. Well, actually, Holly, are there oh, any gang, the any artists, gang, gang records, any gang gang records in Adelaide ever? Mm, no. 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 Yeah. Sorry, Adelaide. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Daryl, let's um, let's do some more positive stuff. Uh, I'm going to put some of your book covers up again. Um, Very positive. This one. Tell us, uh, tell us what someone will 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 learn if they purchase this wonderful tome. This is probably the most dangerous book you can possibly imagine because this actually says it's possible to breed, feed birds in your backyard safely. Now, I'm actually, you know, I'm not advocating that people start feeding birds. I don't need to because, what is it, 35% or something of households already do, so we don't need to start feeding. But if you are feeding birds, here's full of information and it's tips and how to do it properly with so you'll get the most benefit and the birds won't. Um, won't be harmed in any way if you do it properly. But it'll also show you that it's, it's more than just food. You can change your own backyard into a habitat, which is just as important. It doesn't, you don't have to be put out, putting out seed and things. And you probably won't get pink cockatoos coming to your feeder wherever you live. No, that was an interesting cover choice, wasn't it? Um, uh, Holly and I have had the uh, opportunity to have a look at um, uh, your latest uh, your latest book. Yep. Um, what will people find within the covers of Curlews on Vulture Street? Cities, well, birds, people, and me. Yes. Which is which is kind of why you're on the show, Darren. <laughs> well, this is 
pretty much what we've been talking about, Holly and I, at least trying to get across is the, this is a, it's not a curlew, it's a stone curlew. And Vulture Street is in the middle of Brisbane. So what the hell is a rare bird like that doing there? And that's what it's all about is how is it possible for wildlife to survive in cities which are totally human orientated? And it's kind of, it's a memoir. It's my life as starting out as a completely naive and not very smart dude from Wagga Wagga trying to work out what the hell he was going to do with his life, nearly giving up altogether and eventually discovering that animals lived in cities all around him and didn't, you know, and, and, and then that's my career. So it's, it's, it's my life really in there. And you, you did, uh, sorry, yeah. mate, did, did you live on, on or near Vulture Street by any chance? No, you, no, no. But, but, you know, yeah. Vulture Street goes right past the Gabba. Well, I, I, I used to live not off Vulture Street, but off Stanley Street. Oh, uh, just yeah, a, a just a couple of uh, blocks up from the Gabba, um, and as you um, as you will be able to understand, that's not exactly pristine subtropical rainforest habitat anymore. No, but <laughs> but the but there were plenty of cool birds around, and uh, yeah. just down the road from um, Kangaroo Point, and there was some yeah. good places down there. And yeah. um, but the other end of my street uh, ran into Stones Corner, and. and and all around there had low-lying streets that flooded all the time. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people have to live with with all that. But um, you've also got another one out, Daryl, or just – is it is it out now or is it just about out, this one? No, it's, that's out, but the trouble is it's from America. This one was published in the States and they just the, – the books themselves haven't arrived. But lots of people have told me that they've actually ordered them successfully – I, I'm going to say it right now, don't ever use that Amazon for anything. Um, but there's plenty of other versions of um, getting your books sent to your home and you can get them done. And it's even on, it's an audio book. So there's this English bloke talking my words. It's so strange listening to the words that you wrote by a bloke with a very English accent. I, I was going to ask you about that because I've been dipping into the audio book in the last uh, couple of days. Um, I was thinking, who made that decision, Daryl? Seriously, the publishers, the publishers. I'll, I'll, I'll happily, not... I'll happily voice any of your books if you need to get an Australian <laughs> voice. Happily, because um, no, it, well, it's with, with the Curlers book that it'll be me, which will be yeah. terrifying. Well, I was hoping it would be you. I was surprised because, I'm sorry. Nothing but an Australian accent can possibly be acceptable for curlews on Vulture Street, no, even if we're good. not talking stone curlews on Vulture Street. Holly, is there any other rays of light that you would like to um, tell us about before we wrap up? Oh, look, always, always. Um, you know, I know we've sort of been going down dark roads lately, Grant, um, but I think it, it's important to know that, you know, one of the biggest challenges working in urban spaces is the people. Um, but it's also one of the biggest positives because, you know, you can engage with people who genuinely care about wildlife and those people are out there. And like Daryl has said many times, they're the people that will enact change at these sort of local levels. Um and so, you know, th there's this amazing work ongoing. We've just seen it too with the Gang Gang Cockatoo Project. While we did the school version, we also did some online learning for adults who lived in bushfire-affected areas. Um, and while we provided this sort of online learning for people, um, thinking that, you know, that would be a way for them to take their own individual action and, you know, be able just to log on and do their lessons, what we really um, underestimated in that project was that, people wanted to talk to each other and the, the connectivity that people had and the passion that they had for gang gangs. And so we had a, an, an online forum as part of the platform that was incredibly active with people exchanging ideas and sharing stories and working out what worked for them. And we saw it again. We had sort of a celebration event, which was online because I was Sydney-based. Our project officer was Melbourne-based and we were covering Blue Mountains and ACT. And we gave people the opportunity to talk about what they were doing um, as part of that, that project where, they, again, they implemented an action plan on their own properties for gang gangs and, you know, people talking about the plants they got, sharing information about with, which the best nurseries were that, that were able to get their plants from, um, you know, which ones were low in stock for this species but they could actually get these ones. And 
um, people doing videos, you know, showcasing their work, writing blog pieces for their local re their local paper. Like it had such a that communication element was and people wanting to share was really, really critical. Um, and so I think it was really encouraging for something that's, you know, being done online. People are still seeking out those connections and wanting to share their knowledge and share their passion. Um, so while people can be a real challenge in an urban space, people are the solutions in an urban space as well. Fab O, Fab O. Well, if we're going to do some um, uh, ads, I'll do, I'll do the ad for the bird emergency now. Um, we're steaming towards 100 conversations with people like Holly and Daryl and all the other amazing uh, conservationists and activists and researchers. So subscribe to the Bird Emergency Podcast on all the podcast places or go to thebirdemergency.com where most of the live streams that we've done are sitting up there and you can find a bunch of the other ones that aren't on there yet on the YouTube channel. Um, that's what I'm here for. The best, the best place to consume podcasts about birds and conservation that I am the host of anywhere in the world. Um, so please get involved. If you've got something that you would like me to follow up, um, let me know because I'm doing that. Following up on the zoo controversy, Holly, did you see... Did you see me being mean on other people being mean and other people not oh, being mean about uh, about the Kyabram uh, fauna park um, that Zoos Victoria has just taken over? Uh, I missed that. No, oh, well, maybe oh. I'll be interviewing someone from Zoos Victoria next week. They, the PR people suggested I speak to someone and ask that they've turned me down every other time. Maybe they'll say yes this time. That would be good. Um, Daryl, Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the best bird that you're seeing there? And are you maintaining a yard list in in, in Kuala Lumpur? Of, of course, mate. And I've got a yard list. I've got a condominium list, which is we live in a complex. And then I do a, every Thursday morning. I do a survey, a, a citizen science type survey, exactly the same route, exactly the same time of the day, um, mate. The birds are so different. Although I should say there are coels, spotted doves. Sparrows. No, yeah, but tree sparrows. Yeah, tree sparrows. No, no, yeah. no house sparrows. Um, what else? Coel. Yeah, I said, said coels. Yeah. Starlings? Um, yeah, but shining starlings. not Shining starlings. Um, oh, miners. Oh, Indian well, miners, yes. Well, Common we've got, miner. Yeah. We've got five yeah. species of miners, but they're all supposed to be here. I keep yeah. thinking, yeah. it's a bit like seeing possums in New Zealand or, you know. Now, here, they're not, they're just normal birds, you know. That's so right. right. They're so smart. They really are. They really are. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah probably, the, probably the coolest bird would have to be the falconet, which is a, imagine a, a ferocious predator about yeah. this big yeah. that plays that grasshoppers plays, plays on, on um, um, dragonflies and butterflies. Yeah, yeah and but grasshoppers. Yeah, a amazing. ferocious predator. You know, like unbelievable. It's just the minutest little thing, and you can hardly ever see them because they they always have they position themselves on a dead dead tree fifty meters up in the air, so they look as big as an insect anyway. So that is probably the coolest bird I've seen. Yeah, I accidentally saw one in that park that I can't remember oh. the name of that we oh. were talk, talking about, the one with the needle in it. Um, yep, yep, yep. yep. Um, uh, what's it called? You, you uh, it's, called the, it's called the KLCC, so Kuala Lumpur City Centre. City Central Park. Eco Park. Yeah, yeah, that's, Eco park. Right. yeah that's, that's right. Yeah. If you're going to Kuala Lumpur, you've got to go there. It's you've, hard to believe. It's a bit of tropical yeah. jungle right in the middle of town. Yeah. And it's like yeah. where Hyde Park would be in Sydney. Yeah, Incredible. that's amazing. It's amazing stuff. All right, last call for questions or comments before we um, get out of here. I should have some background music for that or something, <laughs> but but I don't. All right, now um, let's plug to Holly. The twenty fifth of this month, uh, we've got Professor. Uh, 
Ewan. Ewan. Ewan's coming on. Oh, um, Ewan. Ewan Richie. Yep. Um, yep. Ewan Richie. Mm -hmm. uh, He'll be good value. Joining us um, to talk about the state of the environment report, which is being released on the 19th. So we're going to have a week to um, digest it. Mm -hmm. Um and we'll talk about that. I'm going to invite a few other people on as well. Uh, I won't, I won't say their names in case they can't join in. But we want to get a range of perspectives and then get a th an idea about what what the priorities need to be. Do we need to recast um, what we think the priorities are, and perhaps the methodology or the strategy if we're going to be uh, polite shit stirrers to get things done because I'm I'm really fearful that we're going to get a whole lot of um, astroturfing or greenwashing by a government that doesn't really want to do anything but wants to look like they're everybody's friend and doing everything. So there we are. Got my tinfoil hat and my pessimism, loud and proud, but I'd, it's just too late to not do things. It's just way too late. Daryl, thanks, mate. Good, great. Uh, thanks. Fantastic. I hope, I hope we can do this again when I come to Kuala Lumpur whenever. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be when, great. When, but, well, it, it would be. It'd be cool. It'd be cool to do it in the park. Yeah, yeah, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. But I'm going to be in town, both your cities, shortly, plugging that, plugging that curly book. So I'll let you know when. Wonderful. Oh, what thank you, Naomi. Naomi's just given us some Facebook love. Thank you very oh, much for that. Uh, very, very good. I can't. No, I can't show Facebook love. I can only show comments. So um, that, that was good. Uh, Holly, what's what's coming across your desk at Bird Life at the moment? Oh, what isn't? It's always busy. Always busy. Um, birds in backyards. Surveys are ongoing, so if anybody wants to let us know what's going on in their backyards or their front yards or their little park down the road, um, you can go to the website that's on the screen now or birdsinbackyards.net and get all your instructions. Um, we're doing, you know, a good chunk of data analysis on, on our citizen science surveys at the moment. So it's um, we're about to let everybody know about how they can better create spaces for bird species in your garden. Fabulous. I should note, everyone, when I've got these birdemergency.com links, they're just lazy links that go straight to yep. the birds in backyards or the relevant uh, petitions or whatever. Yep. Um, the the anti-ratty anti poison <laughs> uh, petition is still out there and uh, going. And, yep, that's uh, right. So... Sorry, Sorry Holly. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, the graphic I've got up at the moment says 24,000 signatures. I think it's more than that because that's a long time ago that I uh, grabbed that image. So if you care about owls and you care about all the other birds that eat stuff like uh, rats and mice, mm -hmm. go and sign the petition. Absolutely. And we've got um, some great new resources coming out and a big week next week on rat poison. So I don't want to give too much away, but if people are interested to go and pop your name on that petition and you'll get all the information sent to you. On that petition, on that petition. Mm -hmm. um, there we are, thebirdemergency.com slash YouTube. You can go and subscribe because I've got to get to 500 before I can unlock some groovy uh features on that to make it easier to do stuff there to share stuff and hey buymeacoffee.com slash bird emergency i need a new camera for photography friday there we are that is what i will be using funds for apart from website hosting and all that kind of stuff but um what was that address daryl can you see that yeah <laughs> Buymeacoffee.com at slash emergency, bird emergency. Sure. There we are. I don't want to only be the only one pushing my own barrel. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Holly. Right. This has been no Monday worries. with Holly. We'll be back in two weeks to talk about the State of the Environment Report. Um, have fun in KL. Right.
Will do. Bye. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye.